like dynamite I never meant to make you cry Make your mind up I'm fading I wanna stay out You wanna stay in Hi and welcome to This is Ibrox, the women's podcast. I'm Tommy McIntyre and for our usual listeners and watchers, you are not mishearing or misseeing things. It is not Scott, Scott in the chair tonight, it is myself. But if you're looking about for friendly voices or faces, I am joined by our regular podcast contributors, Courtney McKenzie. Courtney, hi, how are you? I'm good. Uh, get a pretty, I was back at football on Tuesday and um, got a pretty sore jaw, so I'm actually on medication for that. But apart from that, I'm actually really good. Well, that started us off in a fairly depressing mode. I'm, I'm glad you I finally got... I thought I would get you in, um, in case I like fall off my chair in pain. So if you see me, you know, passing away, then that's why. Be aware that we will just carry on if we see that. Nothing stops the show. That's I'm also joined... To do that. Yeah, I'm also joined by Graham Falk. Graham, how are you doing? Yeah, very well. Not long finished to work, so trucking on. Uh, still stuck in the house, trying to get a place to... To get a pint, but everywhere's seemingly booked up. Um, so I'll maybe get a pint in 2022, which is what I predicted, I think, about four podcasts ago. So good aside from that. Oh, we're yes. such a happy bunch, aren't we? I was going to say, and on those <laughs> re- relatively negative vibes there, we are delighted to be joined by Rangers player Sam Kerr. Sam, as I was saying off screen, we were told you were the funny one. Um, no need to start into that straight away. Save your material t- towards the back end. But listen, thank you so much for joining us. No, thanks for having me. It's nice to be on. So I'll swiftly turn my attention back to Graham. Graham, you were at today's press conference, and I'm wondering if you can give us a brief download of what that sounded like. Yeah, um, obviously he uh, was with Marky. Um, Marky started by saying that Sam's getting sold. Um, he's selling her um, to Celtic, apparently. Um, I don't know if you know this. No, that's not true. Um yeah, it was typical Maggie, really positive. Um, obviously, anyone who listened to the, the podcast or has been in the company of Maggie will know that he's a really positive guy. Um, there was a lot of discussion surrounding uh, team selection because obviously last week he made a few changes. He brought Megan in uh, ahead of Jenna. He brought in, um, well, Emma uh, moved to the bench, came on as a substitute. Sonia's coming back into the squad recently as well and got her first goal last week. Um a lot of the chat from, from Marky was a case of, he was saying he has like starters and finishers, which is something he said before. Um, he mentioned that Megan hasn't really been able to be part of that because you don't necessarily bring on a goalkeeper with 20 minutes to go to give you know someone 20 minutes run out. It's, it tends to be the number one, which is maybe not the luxury you have with a goalkeeper. And he was saying that he's just fully trusting that he could play both of them. He didn't really give away any secrets to who was going to get in, the, in, the, in between the sticks on uh, Sunday for the game. Um, but he basically, same old Rangers mantra, game at a time, he, he wouldn't really touch on the Glasgow City game, despite the fact that I think a few people probably wanted to because it's the big one. It's all about Sunday's game at Motherwell. It was all about taking one game at a time, continuing to keep the good performances up, which he touched on. He classes the Celtic game within that, despite the result. Um, it was just typical standard positive mark. If anyone wants to read sort of his exact quotes, obviously I wrote a little piece on the Scotsman today, um, cheap plug. Um, if you want to have a quick read of it, yeah, you're most welcome um, to do so. But um, typical positive, Margie. Uh, nothing really changes with him. I think, you know, no matter what gets thrown at him, he's all about the next performance, staying positive, getting three points on the board and game at a time, which is, I think it's the mantra of Rangers at the moment, isn't it? So I don't think he's going to shirk away from that. Thanks, Graham. So I'm, I'm, I'll turn to, to Sam now before we move on to Courtney. It's worthwhile getting this one out of the way front and centre before we find out more about your journey as, as well, Sam, before you, you got to that Rangers jersey. But fair to say, and I'm interested in what it was like in the dressing room after a relatively disappointing result, and I say relatively in italics, obviously, disappointing result against uh, our, uh, our rivals from, uh, from Celtic. Yeah, I think, obviously, the result was disappointing, but as well as that, we also lost Kirsty. So it was a bit, a bit of like two, two shocks at the same time to take. Obviously, you go into games feeling positive and you go in thinking that you're going to win the game because you believe as a team that you're going to. So to get uh, two disappointing setbacks was really like, we were really upset after the game and everything, but we came together as a group and we were like, look, like the league's not over yet. Like we've, we've lost the battle, not the war. Like we need to pick ourselves back up again. We need to come in training, smiling, heads high, work hard for each other and the next, every single game we play after this is important. We need to win. And it's not, there's no any time for 
getting complacent and um, going through the motions. It's every, every game is important, every training session is important, and it's time to step up and and give a hundred percent now and not come not become complacent, like I said. Courtney, if I, I move to you, and I think Sam's touched on it there as, as well and, and maybe jumped ahead of where we were going, which is that resilience. So obviously a disappointing result, and I know you had views, strong views on that particular game as well. But I, I'd, I'd like to link that to the robustness of this Rangers team and that mantra that Smalky was talking about in the thread that runs through the squad, which is you can have bumps in the road. It's all about how you get back on, and the, we, we saw that with the 11-0 performance. Yeah, like I, like I was, you know, just about to say there, you, you would never think the Sunday, like seeing the team on the Sunday there against Lawford, you'd never think they, um, they get beat 1-0 off Celtic on Wednesday, you'd never think that, you know, the attitudes were, you know, completely, completely spot on, everyone came out, done their job, you know, Sam got a hat-trick um, and there was many other scorers, so the attitudes were spot on and you could tell that they kind of came out and we're almost like, you know, we're not just going to win this game three or four. We're going to put as many as we can away and just show, you know, I think the word that always comes up with Rangers is relentless. You know, I was speaking to Nicola Dockery. I was like, relentless just speaks, you know, the exact words that, that they that they kind of propose for every game. And the game was disappointing. You know, I literally left the game and never finished basically my job that I was there to do. I was meant to do like a wee um, report and stuff on it. And I, I couldn't sit there. Graham was like dying to leave watching them kind of celebrate in the half circle but I was like I can't you know watch it anymore I said to Louise at Rangers I was like oh I'm leaving she's like oh why and I was like because otherwise I can not watch it to be honest I just want to go home so I just went home but um, I was very glad that you know I attended the, the Florida game and seen the Rangers that we all know and love which is a, a goal scoring one um, I didn't want to go back to it too much because I can't you want to move on from games like that but um I don't feel enough was probably made of that moment with Kirsty in the Celtic game. Um, a lot of people looked at the result, the fact that we had dominated, missed chances, yada, yada, yada. Um, but Kirsty's been massive. It's someone that you've played with and, and known for a long time, both coming from Glasgow City. And I don't think it was a case of she went down, got an injury and then went off. I think us sitting in the stands, me and Courtney, were seeing, well, I seen immediately that whatever happened, which looked completely innocuous, um, was not great, and obviously she was she was on the sidelines for quite a while to the point where the game even started again. I would say it was about fifteen minutes before she actually sort of went down the tunnel, maybe longer. Um, I think we've all been there as fans where we saw players go down and suffer a bad injury, and it plays on your mind as a fan for a little bit, even if it's a big player. I think Marky touched on it in his press conference afterwards and said a lot of you were quite shocked because you could tell the severity of it straight away. Um, you did go on to dominate the game and unfortunately did lose, but how long did it take you to get back in your groove after that, seeing like a teammate and someone you've known for a long time in, in such pain? Yeah, well, Kirsty's obviously one of my best friends. Um, and I mean, it's no excuse for how, how we didn't win the game or anything like that, but I think, I mean, it was at the start of the game and then all you hear is Kirsty screaming and she goes down and we're all running over to check if she's okay and She's like, oh, my knee, my knee, my knee. And then at that instinct, you're just trying to remain positive for her. But at that, like, at that time, you're just like, oh, no, like, this isn't good. You can even tell by the way she's reacting. And me me and Rachel were just trying to remain positive for her. It's quite funny. Rachel was, like, panicking. She was getting the water out, like, the physio bag. She was like, here, Kirsty, take this. And, like, falls over and spills all the water all over Kirsty's chest. And Kirsty's, like, crying and laughing and that. So... Um, and like pure panic and then we were like shaking like it's okay so at least that was um, a little bit of humour in that moment but um, no I think everyone got a bit of a shock to be honest and um, I know for a fact I did um, and I'm pretty sure all the other girls in the team did because we care, care about each other a lot and we're a really close group and seeing anyone whether it's one of your starting players or whether it's uh, one of the finishers um, you're obviously going to be concerned and worried for them but um, I think it took us a little while in the first half to get back into the swing of things. I think maybe we took a wee setback because of that. We were a bit shot. We were not maybe not switched on as much. But um, after half time, we got we got a kick up the arse, which we needed, and we went out there, and that was us. We started dominating more in the second half, and we just never finished, and that was a problem. We had so many chances and just never finished them, and you don't win games if you don't score. How's um, Kirsty Spirits at the moment? Because obviously. There's obviously someone in my family that kind of grew up with her, and I've known how big of a Rangers fan she was through sort of word of mouth, so to speak. Um, so I know, I mean, you've seen her coming up the tunnel with that kind of like swagger that she has. So you knew <laughs> she was up for the game. 
And then for that to happen at a place where she probably doesn't want it to happen. And then for that to kind of stop or halt a Rangers career after five or six games, but she's a positive person from what it seems. Not that I know her particularly outside of, you know, one conversation, but how is her mood at the moment? Is she feeling like, okay? No, she's definitely positive. I mean, what do we all call Kirsty staunch? She's our staunch lassie and, that, and she just comes into tuning and she brings, she just brings that Rangers attitude and she's just really positive and fun to be around. So we actually have a joke right now in tuning and we all say she's, this is the second time she's bottled it. She was at it and she's bottled it because the first time we played them in a friendly, she had a sore groin and then this time she's done her knee. So we're all like, ah, oh, Kirsty, shut the bed, you've bottled it and that. So it's it's a laugh in tuning and we're making, we're making a, light-hearted joke out of a serious situation and we're remaining positive and we're all got our arms around her and we're all there for each other and we're all there for her so no she's all good at the moment good good definitely good to, to hear that uh, the, the squad are supporting her not too sure about the uh the version of magic sponge by uh by firing all, <laughs> the, all the drink over to be honest with you so if you know we've touched on that it's a disappointing result probably in a wider level it's disappointing to lose somebody like, like Kirsty as well but I'm really interested, and in, Courtney, feel free to jump in here as well, in terms of the messages that were replayed about regrouping after that result that were carried in to the four for game as well. And I'm really hoping that you've got the ball somewhere in your house after that game. <laughs> no, I don't have the ball yet, but I've been told I'll get it eventually. So maybe Stevie G will hand me it personally or something. That's what and they're waiting to do. He's, he's, he's filed it straight on eBay. Uh, Courtney's bid. <laughs> No, actually, Everyone. I was actually tweeting the, the kind of results of that game, obviously, because me and Graham were there, and um, a guy replied to the full-time tweet, like, has Sam got the ball yet? And I was like, I don't know, I can't see it. And he was like, well, she should have it. I said, well, relatively, yeah, she's got a hat-trick. And I was like, trying to start an argument with me. I said, I'm not going to take it off. Why do, you think I'm, why do you think I want it? I couldn't even score a hat-trick if I had two right feet, never mind the ones that I do have. But as long as you get it, because I think this guy on Twitter's counting on you having it and putting a picture up with or something. Right, I'll make sure I put a post up with me holding it then. Yeah, you'll definitely need to have, you know, lengthen his worries with it. <laughs> but, but ball aside, um, and we look forward to seeing that seeing that picture, not just a random ball that you picked up out of, <laughs> out of the back, Sam, by the way. But I, I'm, I'm just going back to that. I'm really interested. You know, at this point, we've talked about that already. But as we've said, the best teams, and, you know, we, we've seen that through through all sorts of leagues, the best teams are able to regroup really quickly and then put out statement wins. And you don't get a better statement than, you know, 11 nil. To, to be honest with you. I think that's a pretty conclusive statement. And I'm interested in terms of what was the feeling before the kickoff? Was that in the air or was it just a case of, no, we we're really, really confident in the way we play and in our talent and we'll let that shine? I think we've never really doubted our ability within the squad. We know the way we want to play. We work on it all the time in training. And uh, we all have the belief in each other, um, from the players to the players and the coaching staff to the players. We all believe that we're good enough and we all believe that every game we play that we're going to do well for each other. So I think it was more on Sunday we, we came into the game wanting to do even better for each other because we knew we had a setback on the Wednesday. So it was just that we just didn't want to stop. Even after the first goal, we all turned around to each other and we're like, let's keep going, let's keep going. And we scored more and more goals. And it just showed that even on like the 85th minute, we were still going 100% and going forward and pressing hard if we lost the ball and taking shots at goal. So, yeah, it was just go even harder than we normally go and bring the spirits back up and leave leave the game happy and leave the changing room with full smiles. And that's that's what happened. So it was good. I can't believe Nick at 11-0, by the way. Like me and Courtney were like sitting two metres apart at the game, and it was 11-0, and I'll be honest, I was quite comfortable with 11-0, I kind of figured we might win the game at that point, but <laughs> as soon as the ball hit the back of the net, literally as soon as they crossed the line for the 11th, when um, when uh, Gemmell scored, like, Nick straight away, is like, right, go again, go again, and it's like, it's five minutes, and just chill. Uh, I, yeah, sorry for her, because she's at the back, we're all knackered at the front. When she said that as well, you could see, uh, like, Lauren Perry in the fourth of the fence, that like, just going to stop now, like, he was more happy as if Nick was like, let's go. And you can see Lauren Perry, like, actually considering our, our time at this point, like, I just I just want to go home, like, just please stop it. But, you know, luckily it was 11 and no 12, I suppose. I think that's probably the positive we could take for that. You were talking about the um, 
you know, you're confident in the way you're playing and Matty very much so in pretty much every interaction I've had with him has kind of kept with that, you know, it's about performances. As long as we keep performances going, you're going to get results, which sounds really basic in the way that it is. But I find it quite um, an interesting point that there's there's other managers from, from other clubs have said, you know, Rangers have heavily invested. They've signed all the best players in the league. Um, you know, the, the expectations on them. But um, Mark, you said something quite interesting today in the press conference, which I totally forgot to miss out. He said, you know, you can't buy success. You don't just buy it and then it just works, especially not when you've got a club, which you'll know very, very well in Glasgow City that are, you know, dominant and have been for a long time in Scottish football. Um, is it quite frustrating when sometimes you hear from the outside, a lot of people are saying, oh, Rangers have bought this and bought that and bought the other and they've invested all this money when you're still a new team that's still getting used to each other and how you play and you're still should be expected to have setbacks like you have done well only twice but new teams new builds uh new setups that happens does that get quite frustrating when the people just kind of write off your learning process because they think you've just bought stuff or we've invested more than others i mean i think personally uh for yourself like obviously you you hear everything that else that goes on and as a team we just try not bring that into an our team dynamics i mean I think um, the league is getting stronger and, I mean, there's maybe just not one dominant team anymore and there's going to be lots of good players and I think what it comes down to is mentality and how, mentality within your team. And I know for a fact that our team, we go in every, every training session every day and um, we have that strong mentality that we are one and um, we, we feel the pressure. We, we don't mind the pressure. Like, you're here, you're not only representing... The women's team you're representing rangers as a whole so it's not as if like you're just trying to do well to win the league you're trying to do well for the club and um we have that mentality in the squad that um whatever whatever we face and whatever we hear we just push that to the side and we focus on ourselves and we focus on the process because i mean you're not going to do stuff over the first year we have a long process, we have goals and we all know that and we go in every day knowing our values and our team goals and we're aiming to achieve them and other people talking in the background and other people saying this and that and oh, like how can they do this because they're putting all this money like it doesn't phase us because we, we know what we're there for and people can talk but at the end of the day it all comes down to how you are as a team and how you perform in the pitch and the, the longer goal to be honest. So, yeah. Yeah. No, just just an, an interesting side point is, is a lot of the time you do look at Rangers as, you know, they're a team in, uh, not transition, but a team in progress. And I think, you know, Mark, you've talked an awful lot about the long-term aim. There's, there's no point in winning the league, say, this season and not winning it for another 10 years. It's about sustained yeah. progress, sustained, uh, sustained success, which is really hard to say, actually. Um, but, you know, when you come into to no, Rangers, Graham, let's not talk about uh, any ten in a row. We'll get complaints by some of the people watching <laughs> yeah. the podcast. I don't oh, think no. they've ever existed, to be honest. Um, eight and a half, maybe max. Um, <laughs> when you walk into Rangers, though, and I, I can only say this as someone who goes there occasionally to cover a game for ninety minutes. You're someone who's there who's a, a lot more than myself. Um, and maybe I'm biased, I don't know, but it's probably based on the record. But the minute you open those gates, it feels like a really successful football club. Um, it makes me want to up my game when it comes to doing a match report, um, which is an awful lot about the kind of stature of the play. So do you get that as a footballer as well? You've came from a really successful football club in Glasgow City, supremely successful. But do you feel the same level of success when you walk through those gates at Rangers? Yeah, I think I've obviously the teams I've played with in the past never really associated with a men's side. And then um, I took the opportunity and took, took the risk to come to Rangers because you heard it was going professional and everything. And then as soon as I went there, like blown away, like it's just been amazing. And you you get treated well equally as the men. Um, you walk past them, like Stevie G sometimes comes and watches some of our training sessions. Um, we all, we're all like a close bunch. Um, people go out their way to say hi to you, like the, the chefs, everything like the facilities is incredible you have like the hydro pool you have an indoor indoor uh, 3g ash tub you've got a normal ash tub you've got free grass pitches and everything they can provide for you is amazing and as soon as you walk in you're just like whoa like this is the real deal and it's not as if you're just going you're going to train and play football with your mates like you're here to represent rangers and you're here 
you're here to do your job and you're here to be a professional footballer and it's not until you're in that environment when you really realize like this is my job and this is this is what I need to do and I need to perform and I need to do well for the team and for the club so yeah it's been pretty incredible since I came in and I can't I can't fault it at all it's amazing I'm probably it's, flying too far ahead with it sorry Graham just I think Courtney was jumping in there as well just for a second buddy <laughs> I'll just, I'll just watch it. It's fine. No, I'm See, that's all I'm um, doing here. I'm just directing the, uh, the the question traffic. That's all I'm going to do, guys. It's um, just like a move from Glasgow City. You know, over the years that you were there, you kind of became, you know, a real heart of the club. You know, a, a starter. You were, you know, successful along with like everybody else. You were seen as, you know, you think of Glasgow City, you were alongside like the Crichton and stuff. You know, the face of the club. So was it kind of difficult to leave that behind and leave, you know, almost. Don't want to kind of sound to you, but you know, almost kind of certain success. You guys had won the league for like thirteen years, nearly fourteen. So was it difficult leaving that to to go to something completely brand new and moving into professional football? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I was at Glasgow City five years, and I learned I learned a lot from the players there and from the staff there. And to be honest, I loved my time there. But I got to the certain point in my career where I am. Um, I felt like I've maybe outgrown City a little bit and I was I was ready for a change and I was getting older and I never really I just came out of uni and I was working full time making coffees for people and um uh I decided that I kind of wanted to be in a full time environment and Rangers Rangers invested a lot of money and they were doing it the right way and then when I spoke to them it was just like an opportunity you couldn't turn down and obviously I couldn't see it because I wasn't there at the time but it was a risk I was willing to take to better myself and for my career and it's the best decision I've made and uh, I don't regret it a bit even though I did enjoy my time at City and I did love every minute of it like thanks to them but for now I'm loving Rangers and I'm I'm thankful that I left and it's been great. Well there I mean I'm walking past the the obvious coffee link that you've <laughs> managed to give us there right I'm, I'm not willing to pick, pick that up right but I'm interested. Were there other offers on the on the table, Sam? Was there was there other conversations, or was it single track? I want to be in. I want to be in Rangers. Um, I think I think there was um, obviously me and my agency who talked a bit, and there was opportunities for me to go elsewhere. But I think I think for the age I am, and for for me personally with football, I want to be happy and I want to play games. And I think if you're playing football and you're happy then you get that confidence that you need and when you're confident you perform at your best and I think maybe if I was to leave and I was a bit younger and maybe sat on a bench somewhere or had to kind of fight for my position I wouldn't be as confident as I am now and um, I think it's a it was a great decision for me and hopefully it can just make me better and better and I grow in more confidence and maybe when the time's right in the future then it might be time to move on but for now I'm happy where I'm at and yeah it was a right decision for me I think. I'll take a moment to take a sip of my, my beverage there. I think I've got it. Yeah. Like, I don't know how I've managed to forget to pour a coffee, but I have, so I've just ruined the podcast, so I'll just sign off now. Yeah, unbelievable. We're <laughs> back to that. Clutching our chest and take a seizure. I come I back literally was the one that was like, always oh, have a coffee, and, you know, I don't have one, but I'll just cut it off because I'm not allowed it past a certain time. Um, it's also really important to get the branding of your beverage holders correct as well so it's all about the colour scheme sometimes I mean my bottle's blue like that counts as something but it's not coffee mine's just clear but there you go <laughs> alcoholic which is usual <laughs> I was going to ask um, I suppose it made it easier that you know Rachel McLaughlin Kirsty Hibbert kind of moved about the same time as UA so you must have been that must have pushed you I suppose you didn't need much pushing I suppose to go professional football but did it help you to know that they were kind of coming along with you and that you were going to have familiar faces there, like as soon as you, as soon as you sign. Yeah, I think me, Kirsten, Rachel, I haven't left each other alone for years. And wherever we go, we just all go together. Whether it's on holiday, whether it's to whatever club, we just go there all together. But no, they're my really good friends, and um, I'm thankful to have them as my friends. And um, no matter what decision each of us made, we were we were there for each other. And um, thankfully, we all made the same decision and went to the same club because it's been great since. What's the um? What's what's the coffee thing? I'm not gonna lie, Sam. Like I, for a long while, I followed you and Nick less so for Rangers, more so for coffee. Um, <laughs> you mentioned about serving people coffee before. I believe you may be in the south side with the amount of coffee shops you go to in the south side. But but is that a, a long running thing? Have you just been a big coffee fan for a while? 
Um, well, I used to actually work in the Orium in Edinburgh. I was okay. a wee barista there. I used to serve everyone. I used to stand on my feet for like 10 hours a day and hate my life. But other than that, it was great. <laughs> no, um, I used to I used to make uh, coffees for all like the Hearts players and stuff and then just wish that one day I'll make it professional. Um, but no, me and Nick, me and Nick love our coffee and every Friday we go to West End Fridays. You'll probably see it tomorrow on our Insta stories. Um, every Friday we go to West End and try out the new speciality coffee shops. Um, if if we're if we've had a hard week at gin, we'll maybe get like a wee morning roll. But you never heard that from me. <laughs> is that why Thank when you. it comes to games that Nick Doc Nick Doc is just wanting to keep going until the ninety fifth minute? Aye, because the amount of coffee she's consumed. She also coffee. drink me and her also drink a wee Red Bull before the game as well. <laughs> so <laughs> that probably doesn't help as well. Did you go and drink the two of them together? And I suppose no, the, big no. question, <laughs> the big question is: Tell me, it's normal beans coffee. Not um, decaf and certainly not iced coffee of any nah, type. Nah, nah, none of that stuff. Maybe a decaf if we're on our like six one of the day, but other than that, nah. <laughs> right, I think we can carry on with this podcast then. That's that sounds actually <laughs> relatively feasible yeah. stuff. Um, one thing that obviously is is recently been confirmed. I think today actually, um, which we hope was going to happen and has happened, is that obviously there was that huge gap in between this like the season essentially from December till April, but it's been confirmed that the season's going to continue and you're actually going to be able to get to finish it, which is good for numerous reasons. Because I think if you do win the league, you, you know, you want to win the league by playing all the games. If you don't, you're probably going to lose it by playing all the games. Same way you, you professionally want to play all those games. But getting that news today, how how big was that for, for yourself and the team, knowing that you can finish the season as it should be finished? No, it was really good. I mean, I think we're all pleased and we're all happy that that was a decision that was made. I mean, we all prepared ourselves for the for maybe only seven games being played anyway. But um, so it's it's not much of a difference us going into training or whatever. But um, no, but it's it's good knowing that we have we have the security of the the fourteen games and whatever. So no, it's good. We're happy with it for sure. Good. Um, I wanted to touch on before I'm probably jumping back a little bit here and, and sorry for hogging the podcast here, but nonetheless, <laughs> um, what changes? Um, You've come from an environment, I mean, you've played, obviously, in women's football since you're about 16 at a high level. Um, so it's not like you've suddenly catapulted into sort of professional football out of nowhere. There's been a, a progression there. But I think as someone who works in women's football and, and sees it at a, a close distance, and, and Courtney will probably back me up on this, I think what a lot of people don't give credit to is, is sort of the players that aren't professional, aren't training five days a week uh, have to kind of like shove a Tesco sandwich in their mouth at five o'clock before they get a training and, and then go to the job at five in the morning, which I'm sure you've done. Um, now that you're professional, now that you can concentrate on your football, that's the only thing you necessarily have to worry about. How much has that improved you as a player and as a person? And do you think that the more clubs that become professional, then the more, com- well, obviously it's going to be more competitive, but how competitive do you think the women's game can get as a whole if just people went professional fully and, and allowed themselves to concentrate on football? I mean, I think if if all the, all the teams in the league were able to go professional, we would have a really strong league and we'd manage to get um, more players in and attract more bigger players to come to our league and increase the competition. I mean, hats off to everyone in the league that are still working and studying and manage managing to play every weekend and attend training like four times a week. I mean, we all the other teams in the league still train as much as we do, but the only thing is we we get all the all the benefits of being full time. We have the full time staff, we have all the facilities and um we're still training the amount as all the other teams in the league. So the uh, but the only thing that changes is that full-time status because half of them are working or studying. So, like, it's great that they're able to still keep this league running. But for it to be probably sustainable in the future, then we need to we need to invest. We need um, more investment. We need more support, and that's the only way the Scottish league is going to get better. And you can you can see so Rangers invested, and then look, Glasgow City invested more. Celtic invested more. You see. You see that Spartans are starting to kind of go a little bit full time as well. So it just takes one big club to do it and then all the others follow suit. And then from there, it's just going to make the league better. So hopefully it continues to progress and we make baby steps and get the greater goal in the future. You raise a really interesting point there, Sam. And Courtney, I'll maybe point this to, to one, you first in terms of covering the games as well. So as the league becomes more professional, as Sam quite rightly says there, and 
you know, references Rangers being a leader in that area. And, you know, obviously we've got the new sponsorship deal, which has just come on, uh, been announced, I should say, recently. I'm interested from your perspective, have you seen a difference in the way that coverage of the women's game is being treated and by extension yourself and Graham, the people who cover the game as well? Um, yeah. Like, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, you I go. was going to uh, let you... Uh, no, um, you go. I want you go first. And then <laughs> I'll I've asked a question to fox you all there. Obviously, everybody jumping in. Oh, if it happens, it happens every week, every two weeks we do this without a single doubt. But um, no, it's been it's been mad. You know, me and Graham kind of, you know, with, I work for the SWPL, so technically I shouldn't be biased, but I certainly do put in the request to cover Rangers and... Um, when I do, Graham is usually following me everywhere, you know, kind of, he's like my Nick Dog to my Sam Kerr, if you like. Um, <laughs> everywhere. So, um, no, but it's been really good the last kind of few games that, you know, I've been at certainly, there's been a few more people there, kind of, especially at the kind of the start of the season. Um, there wasn't as many, but it's good, you know, there's a recent, like a new kind of podcast, the, the Women's Football Podcast that's, that's kind of attending games just now, um, doing a lot of work and, at the Celtic game, there's kind of a fair few people there, a lot more than I think me and Graham expected, to be honest. Um, but even with like the new TV deals, I covered it for a for an assignment I had to do and spoke to Kevin Murphy about it actually, um, and Vivian McLaren from the SWFM. The new TV deals are, are doing really well, so I've heard the kind of the numbers for the highlights show and, and everything like that. So it's really good, to be honest. It gives you gives you high hopes for the next few seasons to come, especially as more more teams get more professional. You think well. Surely more people watch it. And one thing I've noticed as well is actually is a lot of people um kind of I really should have my, my wee blue tick on Twitter by now to be honest with them <laughs> reaching out to me, but that's another issue. A lot of people kind of um like messaging me asking like um how they can get into like cover games and stuff and bless them. A lot of people a lot of them just think that like we're fans and have snuck in and just for some reason are allowed in there. But um <laughs> but a lot of people have actually been asking, you know, well, how is it you, how is it you do that? Or I'm a journalist, is there any chance that you can like get me in or whatever they seem to think that i'm like best mates with rangers or whatever but unfortunately <laughs> not not just yet but yeah it's certainly been a really good progression so far this season so i think next season especially the fans hopefully we're allowed in soon that um you know we stadiums and parks will be be uh, sold out i'll jump in to stop to stop us all uh, really and before i turn to you graham sam i'm really interested as we play that up and, and into graham's coverage as well how important is it from your perspective as a as an athlete, as a you know, as a team and as a club, to start to get more of the recognition that you deserve in terms of this for a long time, obviously, the women's game maybe wasn't getting that level of coverage. How important is that, you know, personally and collectively? Uh, I think it's really important. I mean, I mean, there's no doubt we all play it because we love the game and we've played it for many years without hardly any any coverage. And um, we're still playing it the same because we love it and we're getting even more each year. And this year especially, the coverage has been great. Um, you even see like there's like little articles, uh, the Sunday highlight show, you've got you guys doing the podcasts. And it's, it's so important to get women's football out there, especially in Scotland. And uh, to, I don't know the word I'm looking for, mm. uh, to advertise women's football and teams especially like like advertise Rangers women advertise maybe Celtic women as we say and individual players as well because at the end of the day you're still an individual player and and to get the recognition of you doing well and performing well and doing well for yourself is really nice as well and you really appreciate it so yeah it's great and hopefully it can keep coming and keep increasing I think um, just to kind of answer what you were asking before, Tommy, about a, a media side, I'm someone who's probably tried my best to promote women's football since probably about 2017, give or take. Um, sort of learning almost myself about the game and things like that. And I'm not going to lie, it, it's sometimes been a bit of a struggle and, and not just a struggle to, you can write as much as you want, you can do as many match reports, as many interviews and, and sometimes the, the struggle would be getting people to be interested in it and having to be um, quite creative with your, your headline titles and, and it has to be more about, you know, the personal journey of a particular player, why is that interesting, things like that, whereas sometimes with men's football, it could be asking them about a computer game and people will, will read it, and that's kind of the way it's unfortunately been uh, for a long time, and I suppose I'm in a quite a privileged position um, writing for the Scotsman, which essentially is a, you know, a national newspaper, um, 
I've got to be honest and say that they've, they've been great in the sense that they're quite happy and, and probably actively pushed me to to write about the women's football, even though if I'm honest with you, it's not really my role or, or my job. Um, and I've been delighted with it. But I think the big thing for me, and I don't know where this happened, I have a feeling it was the World Cup, particularly in Scotland and particularly in England and probably across the UK, um, was maybe the World Cup. I think it was the first time when, you know, if a match was on, my dad and my brother, I was living back at home at the time, would say, you know, yeah, you're going to watch the match. Yeah, Scotland's playing tonight. And we'd sit and watch the game and things like that. And, and the good thing is now, I think now that we're like approximately just over two years on from it, it's very easy for me and, and Courtney and, and Sam, and all of us to, to write about women's football and, and speak about it and say, you know, promote it, support it, hashtag and all that kind of stuff. But you need people to read it. Um, and the really, really good thing is now, you don't have to sneak a headline in and say um, Rangers boss in the hope that someone thinks it's Stephen Gerrard and accidentally clicks on it. You can say Rangers women boss, Mark e. Thompson, and you'll get people that will still click on it. Yes, it's not of the magnitude of a Stephen Gerrard article, but fair enough that Stephen Gerrard, you're talking a world name, but you can quite easily get thousands of views on a, a women's article, be it Celtic, be it Rangers, be it Glasgow City, be it Hearts, be it Hibs, be it whoever, and people will, will pick up and read it. And I think... Um, What's quite good is, I think, from from experience, and, and Sam and Courtney have far more than I do, but from experience, it felt like a lot of the time, if uh, if someone was interested in women's football, they would gravitate towards a particular player, maybe a Megan Rapinoe and, and Alex Morgan, as opposed to a particular team. Now, whilst that hasn't changed wholly, you're starting to see fans of actual teams. You're starting to see people go to see, they want to go see Rangers, want to go see Celtic want to go see Man United for some reason, um, Man City and, and, and things like that. And I think it's becoming more of a, it's a lot more of a welcoming arena, if, if I can say that, um, than maybe men's football has been. In, in my personal opinion, it's more community-based, but you've seen a lot more people start to have teams that they follow and, and have players, favourite players that are in that team. You can see it changing ever so slightly from the, the outside, uh, sorry, not the outside looking in, from being slightly inside it, shall we say. Um, which is great because you can write about stuff till the cows come home, but you need the fans to be on board with it. You need people to pick a team, and that's what's really picked up. Yeah, just on that, and Courtney, I know you've got a question in a moment, but I'm, I'm just really interested immediately, given some of that and some of the things we've cycled through there and discussed. So I'm just on a personal level, or maybe with the squad in general, how sad was it to see, for example, with the English, or well, the European Super League, I should say, the ESL, tacking on to the bottom of their statement, uh, I'll, I'll thought out one line about women's football. Sorry, what? With the ESL statement that you've seen recently in terms of forming the European Super League, which is now debunked. Oh, yeah. Oh, the statement yeah. just tacked on a little bit about women's football at the end. It was clearly just an afterthought. How, how disappointing is that still to see within those types of conversations? I mean, I feel like there's still quite quite a lot of inequality in women's football compared to men's football, but I feel obviously men's football is so big. Think about how many fans you have, like how big it is within the world. And women's football, maybe not so much in the UK, but in America and stuff, that's really big over there. So we're kind of still at afterthought. Um, obviously, some teams bigger than others. You have like your Arsenal's and your Chelsea's, your Man City's. They're like they're like hand in hand with their men. They're like the big teams down there. Um, so, yeah, it's a shame to be an afterthought, but that's like a whole different thing. That's like women's football and um, equality and like maybe not as being as important because there's not like maybe as much money and as much of a fan base and stuff like that. But I can't really comment on much of that because I'm not really, I'm not really been down there to kind of experience that type of stuff. But yeah, that's just, that's just deeper and bigger issues for now. But um, yeah. Just on the, the progression of women's football, <clears throat> God, I've got a frog in my throat. Um, <laughs> God, um, obviously there's a new deal with the, the women's side, the men's side as well, but I think the biowave deal is certainly more um, benefit, benefit, why can I not speak? Am I taking the <laughs> Benefiting you guys. Um, I, you know, I love them already, the guy from biowave, so such a Rangers fan, you know, we've seen the pictures that he put up with the, the Rangers scarf and stuff, like we love him already, but <laughs> how, how much is that going to benefit, um, like the women's side and, you know, how how nice was it to see that you guys were kind of being thought of 
you know, you're saying you guys get thought of as an afterthought, but by a way of almost put you guys first, first, and, like first and foremost, and wanted to support you guys before anyone else. No, it's great. I mean, you have like a a major sponsorship, just wanting to mostly sponsor the women first, and then uh, tap into the men's side. So it's great that sponsorships and investors are willing to to target the women's side first and foremost, and it's just going to increase and invest more money and make things bigger and better. And and the guys at um, BioWave are great. I mean, we were we were doing a, a wee introduction video for us signing them and. Nick Doc had to score a goal into the mini goals in training. But we had to pass the ball and she had to do a trick and score. And she kept missing missing the goal in an open goal and losing it. And honestly, for about 10 minutes of a possession drill, she kept missing. And we were all getting annoyed, like, come on, like we need to go training. And Muggy's like, give Nick the ball, come on. And then she scores. And it's like the worst goal you ever see. And we're all like, yay, like pure celebrating and everything. Oh. So... <laughs> It was so funny. So wait, wait till you come. Wait till you see that one. That's funny. I was going to say, is this going to be given out to the public? Because this is. Oh, like I hope so. I hope so. And I hope that we should put a bloopers video as well. Because honestly, it was so funny. But no, the guys have been great, and they're a great bunch. And we're so happy that they've decided to sponsor us and stick by us. So it's great. What she should have done was get Kirsty to hold her hands before the the drill because aye, they, and then she'd have been able to score. Then she would have scored it because she clearly holds this power. I oh, see when you said that we were doing that that post match stuff. I was behind the camera. I don't know if you if you watched the full thing, but I was holding the the, the thing for Graham and you said it and you could hear me going like behind the no, camera. No, we had literally done that. We sat in the change room and we held hands and she was like, "Come on, Sam, like you can score." I'm giving you this. So the joke is Kirsty possessed my body and she was playing on the pitch for me. So um, I'm, I'm the inner Kirsty Howitt yeah, for, this the, for the rest of the year. A, he's taking a rather weird time. I know. This is like, <laughs> <laughs> people taking over your bodies and everything. Like, uh, I'm, I'm, I did not have this on my agenda. I am absolutely <laughs> out of my comfort zone here, folks. So trying to possess the body of a host of a podcast here is <laughs> I'll get his uh, I'll get his back on on track, but before we move on to maybe looking ahead to Motherwell and the upcoming games, etc., just one last question on that. And I suppose how pleasing is it as a professional athlete, as part of the team, having having made that move from Glasgow City and all that type of thing, to from a sponsorship perspective and the coverage perspective, to see the club pushing women's games. So you know James Bisgrove out there having those conversations with sponsors, saying no, this is. This is what we want you to be doing. How important is that level of backing from the club? Oh, yeah, so important. I think the club has been great with backing us, even in terms of putting us on RTV right before the men's games. Like, it's like top notch, and you're not really going to get that at any other clubs in our league. You don't see, you don't see kind of like Celtic and stuff doing that, doing that with their women's side. And I think um, our club has been great to us, and they've been treating us really, really well, um, putting us on the grass all the time. Um, treating us fairly, given like the men are sponsored by LucasAid and everything, we get LucasAid packages, we get SIS Sports, so it's great. They treat us, they treat us really fairly, and they treat us, treat us as equal as you can get at this stage before we start, before we start winning things and before before we become bigger and bigger. So it's great that the the club have put that trust in us and they've gave us so much, even though we haven't really actually done anything yet, because. On that we have on paper, we're we're not successful successful at all. All we are is a professional side, and for the club to really support us and give us everything, um, all this coverage as well, it's just great, and uh, we're so thankful for it. And hopefully, we can we can do well for the club and give something back to them. So obviously, we we're talking before about the upcoming games and, and the way that Marky was. Sort of saying one game at a time, and I'm and I'm sure you will agree with that 100. Um, percent Obviously, we've got Motherwell who haven't had the the best of seasons, uh, truth be told, and obviously we won their home game nine nil. Um, truth be told, honest answer is, is the Glasgow City game also in the back of your mind a little bit because of the importance of it, or is it solely focus on that on that Motherwell game and then concentrate on that afterwards? Um, I think we just solely focus on the Motherwell game. Our our aim is to to go in play really well, carry that momentum into the Glasgow City game. So play well on Sunday and have a good week, the full week, and carry that into the, the next again Sunday. So the full focus is Motherwell because even though they might have done not so well this season and the last game we bet them 9-0, I mean, they're still they're still going to give us difficulties. They're going to they're gonna sit in against us. They're still going to be hard to break down. So I don't think we can write off anyone in the league. 
um, you just never know what's going to happen. And uh, we just need to make sure we perform well as a team. Uh, people that come on, people that come off, perform well and recover well. And hopefully we can carry that momentum going forward into the City game. With those games that you've had as well, I suppose there's been two setbacks this season um, that have came, obviously, I think November and then recently. Now, from that first setback, that, that game against uh, Celtic at, at the Rangers training centre, uh, that's probably when the, the strongest, most impressive run of form came directly afterwards, almost like, um, I think as Matthew was saying, you know, when you do have those setbacks about continuing on the, the positives from the performances and also working out, you know, why he lost those games. There hasn't been many defeats in it, but I definitely think, you know, two games after that, it was like 5-0 against Glasgow City, which is a real big feat um, based on everything that we've said throughout this podcast. So almost like that that Celtic game, do you feel that now that you've gone into the fourth game, you've won 11-0, you've got Motherwell coming up and Glasgow City coming up. Do you feel that because you had that minor setback, a sort of reset focus and you feel like you're going to go on a good run again, the confidence is in the in the camp to go on a good run again? Yeah, I think losing might not necessarily be a bad thing for us. I think maybe maybe it was good. Maybe we needed that that kick up the arse. Maybe we were becoming too complacent, complacent and we thought because we're professional, we're going to, we're going to do so well. And um, it just shows that you can't switch off and you need to be fully at it every single week, no matter who you're playing against, no matter how much you dominate the ball, no matter no matter how much you can't score, just one switching off and it can cost you a game. So I think I think going forward, we just need to focus and um, really, really do well for each other and play well as a team. And hopefully we can carry that momentum and we, we get the good spell and we continue that winning streak again. So, yeah. Is it difficult as a former Glasgow City player? You know, you spent a lot of time there, formed like many good friendships that you have, like to this day. Um, is it difficult for you going out there and knowing that you you have to get a really good result to to keep you know we're speaking about it, but to keep your tight hopes alive? Is it is it hard? Do you have to kind of mentally dissociate yourself from your time there and, and just get the task at hand? I think when I first when I first played them, obviously it was like two weeks after I left, so it was a bit weird. But I think. I think you just need to realise that you're a professional player now. Rangers, Rangers is is your home, is your job, and you're there to do well for them. You're there to play well for them and um, win win the league and win games for them. So you need to kind of switch off that emotional side and maybe the friendships and the past and the history you've had there because all it comes down to is uh, doing well for your team and doing your job because ultimately that's what you're paid there to do. That's what that's what you've came there to do. I've came there to be a professional player. I came there to better myself and what what other challenge can you have playing against the team you've been with five years with as you could say probably majority of like the best players in Scotland at that time 13 in a row and all that so yeah it, um, you can you can say it's probably emotional when you kind of think about it a lot but for me I kind of just switched that off and just focus on my jobs and my role as a player of Rangers and um, yeah that's what you got to do and then be friends with them all afterwards that's it. Leave it. Leave it all out on the on the pitch. I'm really interested, you know, as we begin to to wrap up here. Very conscious of your time, obviously, Sam. Uh, and before we get to the obligatory who you nominate next question, <laughs> there we go. I've given you another warning, so you get a chance to think about it, and give Graham and Courtney a chance to think of any last minute questions. Uh, I'm interested from your perspective. Have you got a, a message for the fans watching in terms of, you know, how they can help support you guys and what you're looking to do for the rest of the season? Just thanks for thanks for supporting us and following us so far. Keep watching the games. Uh, hopefully, it's not too long until you're in and actually at, at the training ground and, and watching us play. And we really appreciate the support, support. And hopefully, we can score more goals and do well for you. Right. So I will then, having given you the time, oh. I would then say if there's nothing left in the tank from Graham or Courtney, and I will suggest that there isn't, I will ask you then, Sam. You've been fantastic. But who would you nominate to come on next? Um, I'd nominate Kirsten Riley because um, she might seem she might seem quiet, but she's actually really funny, and I'm sure she has loads of stories to tell you. And there's no chance of any like possessions or holding hands or any any of that type of thing before she comes across. No, 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 no. They, well, actually, you can talk to her about how how every time in a game she just comes up to me and she just says the most random stuff. Um, something about when she headers the ball, will I get wrinkles and everything? She, like, she's just mad. <laughs> One time she headed the ball and she was like, "Oh, am I? 
am I going to get wrinkles from heading the ball? I was like, no, no. Well, I can tell. I am living proof that that does happen to you if you head the ball too much. Then. Yeah, okay, that's why I'll be mentioning. I, exactly. There's just pegs down the back of my head here pulling the skin back. Uh, and, and <laughs> um, so as we as we wrap up, Graham, I would uh, I'd turn to you and I'd say, listen, thank you so much for your time well, again this week. Courtney, absolutely. Likewise, thank you so much for your time. Sam, you've been absolutely fantastic and we really appreciate you giving us uh, the time as well. I would say this has been This Is Ibrooks. I've been Tori McIntyre. Thank you so much for watching. We wish you the very best against Motherwell in the upcoming games and we'll speak to you soon. This is Ibrooks. I'm shaking. You want to go out? I want to stay in a while.